Uh, I also just want to thank uh, Ling, the Environment in Asia series, uh, and the Fairbanks Center uh, for having me. Uh, I really benefited uh, from the, uh, all of those series and the Fairbanks Center's programming when uh, I was a postdoc uh, here uh, about a decade ago um, at the Belfer Center. Uh, and uh, one final thanks, which is to uh, my faculty host, Henry Lee, uh, who's uh, uh, here today. Uh, and thank you, Henry, for uh, for giving me that opportunity uh, and really uh, making today possible uh, in many uh, in many ways. Um, so uh, just to kind of kick uh, kick things off, uh, as Ling kindly mentioned, uh, I did have a book come out uh, last year. That's the starting point um, for this presentation. Um, essentially, uh, the argument of the book is that we should really be thinking about China's rise and its role in the world, principally in terms of two domains. One is uh, ecological sustainability, and the other is emerging technology. With respect to the sustainability uh, kind of issue set, uh, I uh, made the argument that China's importance or the importance of thinking about uh, China uh, in that domain arises not only from China's central and fundamental importance uh, to the world's uh, climate trajectory uh, as the world's largest emitter, but also because uh, climate risk and the impact of climate change plays, I think, an underappreciated role uh, uh, in terms of its implications for uh, the Chinese economy uh, and for China's uh, energy and climate uh, policy area, uh, policy among other areas. And that's really uh, the point of departure for, uh, for this presentation in which I wanted to spend a little bit of time kind of fleshing out that argument. Um, and in particular, uh, an, uh, a sort of conjecture uh, that I have uh, been making since then, uh, which is that of the world's large economies, China arguably may be the most heavily exposed uh, to climate risk for uh, three reasons, which I'll go into uh, in a moment. Before uh, we get there, though, just sort of get us all on the same page about what extreme weather is, why we're talking about it in the context of China. Uh, so there are kind of really f uh, sort of four big manifestations uh, of extreme weather. Uh, one is severe drought, another is extreme precipitation, uh, then there's extreme coastal flooding, and then there are heat waves. Um, there are other uh, manifestations of extreme weather, things like uh, high winds, uh, hail uh, storms that, uh, uh, that occur with unusual frequency or intensity. But for the most part, when we talk about extreme weather, we're talking about uh, these sort of uh, four sets of issues. Uh, another key point about extreme weather, it's uh, directly linked uh, to climate change, although uh, to differing degrees and the, uh, the uh, graphic on the, the left-hand slide uh, uh, side of the slide uh, uh, gives you kind of some indication uh, impressionistically uh, of the uh, uh, amount of, uh, of evidence that substantiates uh, those links. Second point about extreme weather, uh, it's a global phenomenon. It affects uh, pretty much every uh, country. Uh, the graphic on the right-hand side of the slide uh, pertains specifically to the United States. It's the percentage of the continental United States that has experienced uh, one of four, uh, one of these uh, uh, kind of big four extreme weather events. Uh, uh, essentially over the past century. Uh, you can see clearly uh, an increasing uh, trend. So just to say uh, that extreme weather is uh, by no means uh, confined uh, or unique to China, it's certainly a global uh, phenomenon. However, uh, and this is where uh, I'm gonna sort of spend the next three slides kind of putting on the table uh, my, uh, the, the reasons why I think this conjecture may be a reasonable one to make, uh, that China is kind of differentially uh, uh, affected by climate risk uh, and by extreme weather. The first of those has to do with topography. Uh, and this uh, kind of point uh, has, in fact, two uh, components to it. One, which you see depicted in the left-hand uh, side of the slide, has to do uh, with the uh, Himalayan Plateau. Uh, most of that, the world's uh, largest in terms of spatial extent, high uh, altitude region, uh, is, of course, uh, within uh, Chinese uh, uh, territory, the bounds of the modern uh, Chinese state. And the key point about that is that because of its high elevation, that region has been warming uh, at a higher rate uh, than the rest of the Earth's uh, land mass. Uh, and that's what you see with the, uh, the red line is uh, uh, the Tibetan Plateau. The blue line uh, is the rest of China. Uh, the left-hand part of the graph here shows uh, observed uh, temperature, and the right-hand side is, uh, uh, is uh, projected. Uh, but in both cases, uh, you see that those rates of warming on the Tibetan Plateau are uh, quite a bit higher uh, than what you see for uh, the rest of uh, the Chinese landmass. Um, this uh, uh, is similar to what uh, you see in the polar regions in terms of uh, the poles warming at a faster rate uh, 
than the rest uh, of the planet, uh, to the point where a lot of people refer to the Himalayan Plateau as the third pole. Um, this has a lot of implications, not just for, you know, kind of local ecosystems in, uh, um, in the Tibetan uh, and Himalayan region, uh, but also for uh, water availability, which uh, I'll come back to uh, in a second. The second kind of geographic or uh, topographic uh, issue that I want to point out uh, has to do with uh, essentially coastal geography. Uh, uh, and you can see here, this is sort of a, a rough elevation uh, map where you've got huge swaths uh, of the coastal provinces that are uh, at or just barely above uh, sea level. Uh, and that's significant when you think about uh, the population density, where this, uh, uh, how this topography relates to China's urban geography. And I'll come back to that uh, in just a second. But just to give you some uh, sense of that vulnerability, obviously huge portions uh, of the, uh, the northeastern uh, 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 seaboard that are uh, heavily uh, exposed to uh, coastal flooding, uh, as well as pretty significant uh, regions uh, in the Pearl River Delta and a couple of uh, more inland regions as well um, that you can see uh, in places like here. Uh, just to kind of uh, cap uh, all this off, uh, uh, 2021 World Bank report uh, ranked China 61st out of 181 uh, economies in terms of its exposure uh, to climate risk uh, and uh, came to the conclusion that uh, in relation to uh, other uh, economies, China does in fact uh, face uh, a fairly substantial uh, degree of climate risk. That gets to uh, the second aspect of what I would argue is China's distinctive uh, vulnerability uh, to climate risk or extreme weather impacts, uh, and that's the sheer extent of urbanization. I'm not sure it's uh, as widely appreciated as it perhaps should be, uh, both the speed and scale uh, of China's urbanization uh, in the uh, reform era, which is absolutely staggering. Uh, and this uh, graph gives you some indication of that. Um, this is urban population of several of the world's large uh, countries from 1950 uh, uh, essentially out to 2030. Uh, and you can see uh, that uh, China's uh, uh, increase in urban population has outstripped all but uh, a few other uh, countries in the world uh, to the point where from 1970 to 2010, China's urban population uh, grew by the better part of 300%. Um, really an astonishing uh, rate of urbanization that probably all things considered has no equal uh, in, uh, in human history. Um, it's not just population density, though, um, when you think about uh, how the extent of that urbanization maps to climate risk or vulnerability to extreme weather. It's also the value of assets concentrated in th those urban areas and in China's built environment. There are a lot of ways that you could look, about, look at this or think about it. Um, this is simply sort of one that I found rather interesting. Uh, and it's a chart that compares average home prices for second tier uh, Chinese cities uh, to several UK cities. Um, and shows, uh, I think, in an interesting way uh, uh, that uh, home prices uh, in second-tier Chinese cities actually compare pretty favorably uh, to uh, second-tier British cities, for example. Um, very anecdotal, uh, but I think it, uh, it does show uh, that one thing that is uh, distinctive about China is that, again, thinking not just about the density of population in its urban areas, but also the value uh, of assets concentrated in those urban areas. So again, if we're thinking about the potential impact uh, of an extreme weather event uh, in these large, uh, densely settled areas, uh, you're not uh, only thinking about the risk to uh, human lives, but also uh, the economic impact uh, of extreme weather uh, events uh, occurring in these, uh, in these urban areas. Okay, so getting uh, to kind of uh, the main event and thinking in a little bit more uh, detail about uh, some of the specific extreme weather that China's experienced in the last few years uh, that Ling uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, we're gonna kind of arbitrarily start uh, in 2020. Uh, this is uh, the year in which uh, the Yangtze uh, Basin, um, this region here <coughs> experienced a month uh, of uh, 300 to over 500 uh, millimeters uh, of rainfall. This is about 20% uh, above normal uh, for this time of year. Uh, this is again about a 30 day um, period. That um, was so severe uh, that it uh, created some credible concerns uh, that uh, Three Gorges uh, may be sort of uh, nearing its, uh, its design capacity. Um, there was briefly some, uh, some social media uh, kind of back and forth over uh, supposed kind of deformation of the dam 
uh, just as a result of the sheer uh, kind of volume of water uh, that was being impounded by the dam. As far as I can tell, uh, that was never really a concern. Three Gorges was never really uh, anywhere close to its, uh, its design capacity. Uh, but uh, uh, the rainfall was severe enough that at least one major dam did fail uh, in the Yanza Basin uh, in this period. Uh, and certainly it created uh, plenty of, uh, uh, of property damage. Then we get uh, to 2021, uh, the following summer, uh, when another part of central China, uh, this time uh, centered mostly on uh, Henan uh, uh, province, uh, suffered a, another bout of uh, catastrophic flooding. Uh, this is the inside of the uh, Zhengzhou subway. Uh, about 500 people were trapped uh, underground. Uh, regrettably, uh, about 13, I think it was either 12 or 13, I forget the, uh, the precise figure, uh, people died uh, in this uh, event. Another aspect of the 2021 uh, bout of extreme weather was that this uh, period of catastrophic flooding uh, centered on uh, Henan uh, coincided with a period of extreme drought uh, uh, in other parts of the Yellow uh, River Basin, which gets to a key uh, feature of extreme weather that I'll come back to a little bit later uh, in the talk that oftentimes you get multiple uh, forms of extreme weather coinciding uh, at once uh, and obviously uh, having uh, uh, manifold uh, repercussions uh, as a result. Getting to 2022, the bottom uh, panel of this uh, map here shows uh, uh, temperature uh, in 2022 uh, versus uh, 2021. And again, I mentioned that uh, there were parts of, uh, of China that experienced uh, uh, drought uh, in the summer of 2021. Uh, but you can see that average temperatures were quite a bit higher uh, in uh, 2022. Um, what this uh, map doesn't really show uh, in terms of its uh, uh, intensity is that uh, the 2022 uh, heat wave uh, was uh, almost certainly the most uh, severe and acute uh, in the meteorological record uh, in at least three dimensions. The length of time, the uh, 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 maximum average temperature, uh, uh, the degree of the maximum average temperature, and then uh, the number of people affected. So it's sort of a triple uh, record, triply record-breaking uh, uh, event. Um, also uh, coincided with uh, some significant drought, um, which had major uh, economic uh, impacts that I'll come back to uh, a little bit uh, later on. Finally, getting to uh, this past summer, which uh, Ling mentioned in sort of, sort of motivating um, this, uh, this talk. Um, so this is a map of uh, total rainfall over a three-day period uh, in July. Uh, this is uh, Beijing. So this is uh, during Typhoon uh, Duxuri. Uh, and the really striking thing, I mean, you can see how vast this, this kind of area is uh, and uh, the intensity of this rainfall. But the striking thing is if you compare it uh, to uh, uh, these regions that are sort of more in the, the high tropics, places where you would expect to get uh, really intense rainfall uh, in the summer months. This is really, really uh, unusual. And in fact, it was so uh, intense that as the caption here says, uh, Typhoon Duxuri uh, uh, resulted in the heaviest rains uh, recorded in China, essentially in the, the modern history uh, of, uh, uh, of meteorological records. Another way of looking at this, so this, is, uh, this bar is total rainfall. Um, so this is over 100 uh, millimeters. Uh, and if you think about going back to, uh, back to our 2020, oh, sorry, um, here you've got uh, you know, a third, somewhere between a third to a fifth uh, the uh, total amount of rainfall that uh, was experienced uh, in central China in 2020, but over a three-day period uh, as opposed to a 30-day uh, period. So an extremely uh, intense uh, rainfall event. Uh, and again, uh, several dozen people uh, died uh, as a result uh, of that. Okay, so we've kind of covered just the last few years, hopefully convinced you that extreme weather uh, is, a major, uh, is a major problem uh, for China as well as uh, pretty much every other country uh, around the world. Now let's just spend uh, a minute looking uh, at, uh, uh, at this in kind of uh, much longer historical uh, perspective. Uh, so the top panel here uh, is long-term uh, rainfall uh, or precipitation in China from 1950 uh, to essentially the present. Uh, and you can see there's actually a, a modestly uh, increasing uh, trend in rainfall over that, uh, over that period. If you look at panels B and C, though, uh, which take us back to 5,000 years uh, BCE, uh, and some of this is modeled, of course, um, uh, you see a, a generally decreasing uh, overall trend, uh, 
panel C here uh, are rainfall anomalies. So again, you can see a, a generally uh, increasing frequency of negative uh, uh, rainfall as we kind of get closer to, uh, uh, to the, um, uh, the present. Um, I want to briefly, uh, although it's sort of incidental to uh, our purposes here, just briefly dwell on panel E. Uh, this is quite an interesting uh, paper, um, uh, and it basically uh, tries to correlate uh, certain uh, periods of state formation and warfare in China's history to uh, uh, rainfall anomalies. Uh, um, personally, I'm a little skeptical of, of these kinds of correlations, but not, not exactly my field. Uh, and I figured, uh, given the uh, uh, environment in Asia topic here, this may be interesting to just briefly note. Uh, but you can sort of see here that, uh, you know, just sort of impressionistically, uh, they correlate uh, periods in state formation uh, as well as spikes in warfare uh, to some of the uh, rainfall anomalies that you see in the uh, climactic uh, record um, for, for China. Okay. So diving a little bit more into what we can expect uh, for China uh, going into uh, the future. I'm going to show a couple of these, uh, these graphics here. Um, they're very busy. Um, so let me just sort of briefly explain that the, the rows here uh, are different indices of, uh, of uh, pre precipitation uh, anomalies, in this case, temperature in uh, the other graphic I'm going to show, um, which, again, is quite busy. Um, what I like about uh, this is, well, it's also from a recent, uh, more recent paper, uh, but it also uh, shows fairly clearly what uh, the expected impact of different warming scenarios uh, are. Those are the columns, and those are the, really the things to, uh, to pay attention to. This is uh, 0 0.5 degrees of warming, 1.5 degrees of warming, 2 degrees of warming. We're already past this. We're more or less past that. This is where we're headed, and we'll get to uh, unless something pretty significant changes very, very soon. Um, so the key thing, uh, I think, in all of these, uh, these panels to note uh, is simply how, uh, uh, how much more intense uh, rainfall precipitation anomalies get uh, when you move certainly from uh, uh, 0 0.5 degrees of warming uh, to 1.5, but especially 1.5 uh, to 2. Um, and you can all, the second thing uh, to note here is that these uh, anomalies uh, are pretty much uh, something that affects uh, China nationwide. Um, a third thing to note, uh, which we'll come back to uh, in a second, this is uh, consecutive dry days, CDD, um, is that uh, you also uh, see some evidence, even though you see overall uh, increasing precipitation uh, across China, you also see in some uh, scenarios uh, an increase in uh, drought or water shortage events uh, in this particular southwestern uh, uh, part of the country. In some uh, models the southeast uh, as well. But this is really significant because uh, of the geography uh, falling on the Himalayan uh, plateau. As I'll uh, come back to in a second, this is a really important water source for uh, most, of the major, uh, most of the major rivers. Uh, and indeed, a second physical impact uh, that I want to highlight has to do uh, with uh, the impact of climate change on water availability in the major uh, basins in China, really across uh, the country as a whole. Um, so you might, may have heard the, the phrase, China is the water tower uh, of Asia. Uh, well, that water tower, uh, what that actually uh, means it are uh, glaciers and uh, snowpacks uh, in the Himalaya that provide, uh, mostly through seasonal melt, um, the flow of uh, all of China's, almost all of China's major rivers, uh, many of uh, Asia's uh, major rivers overall. Um, this graph uh, shows three of the, the major uh, basins within China. Uh, and how we can expect uh, glacial melt to respond to several different uh, warming scenarios. These are, these are different, uh, well, they're not, strictly speaking, just warming scenarios. These are um, uh, different sort of climate policy pathways that have uh, uh, implications, of course, for what the degree of warming uh, is. But basically what you can see is that in, in all of them, uh, there's an increase uh, in glacial runoff followed by a decrease. And uh, really, each scenario differs mostly in terms of how early um, that peak comes and then how severe the drop-off is. But the basic implication here uh, is that with any degree of warming, what you're going to see is a temporary increase in the flow of major uh, rivers and water bodies in China as you get uh, melt of uh, glaciers and, uh, and snowpack. And then you get a decrease uh, because that's not coming back, that volume or mass. Uh, of glacier or snowpack uh, is not coming back in a warming world. Uh, so obviously uh, a significant implication for water availability in uh, the major uh, rivers. 
Okay, third uh, physical impact uh, I just want to point to, though perhaps it's the most obvious, uh, has to do with uh, temperature. So similar to uh, the precipitation uh, uh, projections, uh, you certainly see greatest intensity uh, of uh, temperature uh, change in the two degree warming scenario. Again, it's pretty much nationwide, though in some simulations or some scenarios, you see uh, significant regional impacts uh, here, for example, in Dongbei. Um, but needless to say, um, you're seeing uh, pretty significant uh, uh, temperature increases uh, and the uh, expected incidence of extreme heat waves uh, nationwide. The other thing that's uh, important to, uh, uh, to think about with uh, uh, temperature in particular uh, is that uh, pretty much all of these uh, scenarios suggest that East Asia is going to warm at a slightly uh, higher rate uh, than, the, uh, than the planet as a whole. So this is just an, an excerpt here from the paper uh, that makes uh, that point. Okay, uh, so I want to move now uh, to socioeconomic uh, impacts or implications. And the one that I want to start with, in part because it's very closely related to, uh, uh, to heat, uh, is health. Um, this is something that uh, we don't always think as uh, kind of automatically about in terms of uh, climate impacts, um, but from uh, a social as well as an economic uh, perspective is a really uh, important one. This, uh, these, uh, well, it's, it's one graphic, two uh, panels, I guess, uh, comes from a really interesting Lancet uh, study that came out last year, um, looking specifically at the, uh, uh, the climate uh, implication, or the, the health uh, impacts of climate change for China. Um, these two graphs show physical activity hours lost. And this is actually not projected, this is uh, uh, sort of actual uh, estimated um, uh, for the past few years. Uh, this uh, panel here shows uh, physical activity hours lost uh, since you know, the year 2000, essentially up to uh, the present uh, uh, versus uh, this, this kind of blue dotted line baseline. Uh, and then the panel on the right here shows uh, some estimate uh, of the, uh, how that breakdown is regionally uh, uh, disaggregated across China. Um, and you can see, you know, it's a, a fairly uh, small number of hours uh, per day, um, but nonetheless uh, significant. And uh, this kind of data mostly goes to kind of uh, health, uh, uh, kind of physical activity uh, metrics, but you can also just imagine uh, what the implications of this uh, might be uh, just in terms of aggregate economic uh, performance. If you're losing uh, this number of outside uh, activity uh, uh, days uh, activity hours per day, that's going to have significant implications for uh, industries or sectors like construction or agriculture that involve a lot of outdoor work. Uh, and in fact, I might just give uh, a quick plug uh, to some of the work of uh, some of my colleagues uh, at Penn uh, uh, who focus on the labor economics of climate change. Um, and what we're finding, uh, or what they're finding rather, I shouldn't claim any credit for it, uh, is that uh, the second and third uh, order effects of, uh, of climate effects like heat uh, are, are absolutely enormous as you kind of ripple through uh, the economy as a whole and through uh, the labor market. So uh, again, just to kind of underscore uh, that, uh, and I'll get to in a second some estimates of kind of direct damages associated with extreme weather uh, and climate impacts in China, but none of those capture the second or third order uh, impacts uh, like health, um, even though they do have uh, distinct economic implications attached to them. Getting to some of those uh, direct loss uh, estimates, uh, this is uh, an estimate of direct economic losses associated with natural disasters for each uh, Chinese province for the year uh, 2021. Um, this is, uh, just as a reminder, uh, the year that Hunan in particular suffered that catastrophic flooding incident that resulted in the, uh, the flooding of the Zhengzhou subway. Uh, and so you can see uh, that at the top, Hunan had the, uh, the highest uh, direct loss uh, uh, burden that year. Um, this equated to about uh, 20 billion uh, US um, uh, or about 5.6% uh, uh, of uh, Henan's uh, GDP for, uh, for the year. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, kind of what that means in the context of China's overall economy uh, in a second. Um, getting uh, uh, sort of beyond just direct loss uh, estimates though, another uh, kind of key thing to appreciate about many of these recent extreme weather events is that they caused um, ripple effects across supply chains. So the macroeconomic impact of uh, these individual extreme weather events went far beyond uh, the, the so-called direct uh, economic losses. Um, so in particular, in the 2022 bout of extreme weather, which uh, as, you, as you'll recall, was uh, an extreme heat wave uh, 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 coinciding with 
uh, a pretty severe drought uh, in the upper Yangtze uh, 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 basin. That uh, resulted in uh, a decrease in hydropower production, which in turn uh, caused uh, slowdowns or uh, partial cl factory closures uh, across a lot of the, the Yangtze uh, economic belt. Um, the overall impact of that for uh, 2022 was estimated to be perhaps about 0.3% of China's GDP um, for the year. Now, I want to spend a second talking about uh, that in some context. So that equates uh, to uh, probably around 51 billion uh, US dollars. Um, that's real money. Uh, and yet, um, not all that uh, uh, dramatic uh, in the context of a $17 trillion economy uh, or when Walmart's uh, revenue uh, annually is $611 billion uh, a year. However, um, I think it's important to uh, think about that, uh, uh, that economic impact, not just in the context of direct uh, uh, proportion to the, the uh, total Chinese economy, uh, but also uh, in uh, a localized sense for what that means for the regions most heavily affected. Again, thinking about uh, Henan suffering a $20 billion uh, economic loss in 2021 uh, on its own, as well as how the burden uh, of that cost is uh, apportioned. Who is actually paying uh, uh, for that, uh, that cost? Uh, and I'll come back to uh, the implications of that in, uh, in a couple slides. Okay, so now I want to move into uh, it, having covered uh, and I hope outlined a little bit what China's sort of vulnerability or risk profile looks like with respect to certain extreme weather uh, uh, impacts. I want to now focus on what uh, China's responses uh, to some of those uh, risks have been and what, uh, in a sense, China's adaptive capacity looks like. Um, and the place that uh, I, I think it's relevant to start uh, is reservoir capacity. And this is really important because when you have reservoirs, you have, not all, you have a means to store water, uh, and that's going to help you uh, in times of uh, water shortage or severe drought. But it's also going to help you, at least under certain circumstances, uh, in times of flooding, uh, because it's going to give you uh, some tool to modulate uh, the flow of water um, through major uh, river basins. Uh, the panel on the left here uh, just gives you one uh, kind of metric of how China stacks up in reservoir capacity to other countries. Uh, and you can see that it is uh, quite, uh, quite well equipped there. Um, the panel on the right, on the right uh, is perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, indicative, though, uh, in terms of showing you where uh, this capacity comes from. Uh, and it comes from uh, a huge spate of dam construction that uh, really uh, accelerated pretty dramatically after uh, the, year, uh, uh, the year 2000. Um, now, I hasten to say that when I uh, talk about something like uh, reservoir capacity as a result of dam construction, um, this isn't like an adaptive strategy that uh, uh, China is mounting uh, in response to extreme weather. These uh, uh, pieces of, of infrastructure have been planned for decades, um, so it's not the case that this is sort of a direct uh, response to extreme weather or climate risk, um, but it is uh, an important element of adaptive capacity. Again. Um, both because reservoirs give you the ability to uh, store water in times of shortage and because they give you, uh, at least uh, in principle and in certain circumstances, a way to buffer um, flood risk um, uh, in major basins. What's uh, more important uh, and more distinctive in the case of China uh, is not only this amount of storage capacity, but it's also a way to move uh, physically water between basins uh, or in water speak uh, to affect interbasin transfer. This is really uh, important because, especially under uh, these climate scenarios that I, I sort of depicted earlier, it's quite likely that you're going to have uh, more intense uh, uh, either uh, periods of drought or shortage um, that's regionally uh, differentiated. And recur, uh, recall, for example, in 2021, you had extreme uh, flooding uh, occur in one part of China and extreme drought uh, in another. In principle, uh, something like, uh, uh, so, and this uh, system uh, is Nan Shui Bei Diao, uh, the South North Water Transfer. Uh, uh, I refer to it as China's national plumbing system um, because what it does uh, is essentially provide a means to move physically um, water between China's two major uh, river basins. Um, I could go on for some uh, time about this because I think it's a really fascinating uh, kind of example of. Uh, uh, of uh, kind of uh, 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 technological states, but I'll, I, I, won't, I won't belabor that except to say 
um, that this is a project that has arguably been uh, one of the more significant uh, in the history of the People's Republic. Um, it's something that's been underway uh, almost uh, since the People's Republic was founded. This is a 1950s uh, Remy Rubao uh, article that heralds the kind of initiation of uh, some construction of uh, the water transfer. Uh, today, um, and this is kind of the, the more significant thing for our purposes, um, there are two active uh, kind of phases of uh, the water transfer known as the eastern and middle routes um, that again link uh, the Yangtze and uh, Greater Yellow uh, River basins um, and supply water uh, principally from parts of central China uh, to uh, many of the large uh, northern and coastal cities. Um, I hasten to, to add, and thinking back to some of the more recent extreme weather uh, events that I mentioned, um, the uh, uh, availability of water in these parts of central China that were intended to be kind of the source regions is not as reliable as, uh, uh, as was uh, uh, thought to be the case when the water transfer was planned. Um, so now there are uh, all these kind of secondary diversions that, uh, uh, that have been constructed. Um, and there's growing talk, though I still think it's highly unlikely that this will ever be built, uh, around uh, the proposed western uh, route of the transfer, which would link uh, essentially the headwaters uh, of both the Yangtze uh, and the Yellow. This would involve uh, basically drilling a giant tunnel several hundred kilometers through the high uh, Himalayan uh, mountains. Um, pretty, uh, pretty wild uh, uh, kind of uh, proposal. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, what this does is uh, give China a pretty... Uh, interesting and important means of, again, physically moving uh, significant quantities of water uh, from uh, one basin to the other, um, which is really important uh, when you think about the variability uh, uh, of water uh, given these extreme weather uh, events. It's not just uh, infrastructure, uh, though, that's uh, significant in terms of China's adaptive capacity. Uh, it's also the integration with uh, various uh, uh, other technologies. Um, this is a, uh, a picture of, I don't know if, uh, how many people may have seen uh, Dr. Strangelove and the big board uh, uh, that's depicted in that movie. This is sort of like the water management nerd version of the big board um, that is present at the, uh, the Yellow River Conservancy Commission headquarters in Zhengzhou, uh, ironically, uh, where that catastrophic flooding uh, took place in 2021. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, center and this board integrates a whole bunch of uh, real-time uh, flow sensors from throughout the Yellow River Basin with uh, automated kind of devices that allow operators in this center to automatically open and shut the slice gates on uh, uh, the, many of the, the dams along uh, the river. Uh, and then uh, it's also integrated with uh, flood and, um, uh, and weather forecasting uh, uh, systems. So in principle, uh, this sort of integration of uh, infrastructure and technology permits a, a, a very uh, integrated uh, uh, system of managing uh, the whole Yellow River Basin. Um, this is present in many of China's other basins, by the way, and in principle uh, allows for uh, the predictive management uh, of flood uh, as well as water shortage uh, events. Uh, switching to from China's kind of inland waters to the coasts, um, uh, prolific uh, seawall construction uh, along China's coastal uh, regions. This is, of course, a response to uh, the threat of coastal flooding. And, and recall uh, the first slide about uh, the, uh, the kind of coastal topography and geography, uh, particularly in China's uh, large urban regions. Uh, this graph uh, actually doesn't show seawall construction. It shows reclaimed uh, area per year. Um, this uh, was kind of taken in this, this uh, uh, paper as sort of a proxy for uh, the amount of seawall construction. Uh, the other thing I'll just say about seawalls is that like a lot of other uh, infrastructure, the cost is nonlinear. So if you want to uh, build a seawall that's going to protect you from uh, uh, five meters of sea level rise, uh, that's more than twice as expensive uh, as building uh, one that's going to protect you from 2.5 meters uh, of sea level rise or storm surge. Um, so while it's a, a sort of ready infrastructure solution, it's by no means a cheap or uh, easy one. Um, also really important that there are uh, some really interesting institutional uh, responses to various manifestations of climate risk. Um, and one that I think is particularly fascinating uh, is uh, called the State Flood Control and Drought Relief uh, Headquarters. This is an infrastructure that's been around for uh, several decades um, 
and I you know, would, not, would not claim to be uh, 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 an authority on this topic, but uh, I would venture that it's until very recently, um, one of the more uh, impressive examples of interagency or intergovernmental uh, coordination uh, that we see in uh, the Chinese kind of administrative uh, apparatus. Uh, and you can, so this is sort of, you know, like an, uh, uh, an organization chart. Uh, and you can see that there's, uh, and I should say the, the Ministry of Water Resources is sort of the lead for this uh, structure, um, but it, uh, it integrates uh, representatives from, uh, the, uh, uh, from all kinds of, uh, of entities, public safety, you've got, uh, I don't know if it's here, but like uh, transportation, um, all kinds of different uh, uh, ministries and agencies. Uh, also significant that it is uh, typically led by someone at the state councilor level. Um, this uh, 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 particular hierarchy is a little uh, outdated, but at the time it was uh, Wang Yong. Uh, and further uh, indicated in terms of the uh, prominence given to this institution, at least uh, uh, in times of crisis, uh, this particular session, which was uh, 2016, uh, was chaired by the late uh, Li Keqiang. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a, an entity and a piece of institutional infrastructure uh, that at least at times of flood and drought emergency um, really is given a lot of prominence uh, within uh, China's uh, political system and facilitates, um, I would say, reasonably effective uh, intergovernmental interagency uh, coordination. Um, a final interesting kind of tidbit uh, of this system is that under the uh, provisions of the um, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, the, the uh, emergency law, um, this uh, body uh, is empowered under certain circumstances to direct uh, PLA units. It's one of the few instances in which uh, civil authorities have the ability to uh, direct uh, PLA units. They tend to mostly be uh, armed police, uh, but nonetheless, one of the few uh, uh, instances in which uh, civil authorities can sort of regularly and operationally uh, direct uh, PLA units given the strict separation that's followed most of the time. Okay, um, so coming to a little bit of kind of a, a, a sum up here of how these uh, responses have, uh, uh, have, have stacked up uh, to China's uh, climate risk and extreme weather uh, exposure. Uh, so I would say that China has had uh, really pretty incredible success uh, in the specific field uh, of flood control. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna, just gonna throw uh, kind of something out uh, on the table, uh, I'd be really interested if anyone would either uh, uh, agree or, or challenge me on this, that uh, China's success in flood control, uh, especially over the last uh, 30 years, has actually been one of the more impressive successes of the post-reform state overall. Um, let me briefly say why I think there's a, a somewhat something of a case for that. Um, so the panel over here uh, shows investment in flood uh, protection. Uh, it's the brown uh, kind of segment of the graph. The blue segment here uh, is overall kind of water management uh, uh, infrastructure investment. So that's uh, other forms of, uh, of water infrastructure. The graph on the right here, it's actually two panels, uh, shows affected population in millions uh, of floods. Uh, the, uh, the line here are, is deaths. Uh, and then here we have uh, on this side, uh, direct economic losses associated. Uh, with floods, and in both cases, you can see uh, pretty dramatic uh, declines uh, since uh, 1990. Uh, brief point uh, to say that in 1998, there was a particularly catastrophic um, flood, um, uh, and that uh, galvanized a lot of policy action uh, and investment uh, in, uh, in flood control. Oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, on the other hand, um, Massive failure uh, in a really uh, critical area of uh, adapting to climate risk, and that's in the field of insurance. I mentioned that one of, I think, the important ways to think about uh, the overall economic impact of extreme weather and climate risk in China is thinking about who bears uh, the cost uh, and how those costs get apportioned uh, throughout society and the economy. Well, in most developed countries, uh, that happens principally through insurance markets. Uh, in China, uh, that's not the case because insurance markets are uh, very poorly developed uh, and generally uh, quite dysfunctional. Um, so you see here a couple of uh, statistics that, that generally go to that, uh, including uh, the fact that uh, insurance uh, uh, covers uh, somewhere between uh, uh, you know, a third and a fourth uh, of uh, uh, losses uh, re relative to the global average. Another way of looking at that uh, relatively low insurance penetration 
uh, is through this graph, which shows insured losses as a percentage of overall losses caused by natural disasters from 2008 to 2020. And you can see that the percentage is steadily increasing, but still extremely low. Um, this is, uh, I think, a, a really kind of the heart of China's continued uh, vulnerability uh, to extreme weather and climate risk, where even if, um, as I have suggested, uh, the economic impact, uh, macroeconomic impact so far has been somewhat uh, muted, uh, albeit you know, extremely uh, severe and significant for particular regions, this is a huge Achilles heel. The lack of a functional uh, insurance market uh, uh, means that there really is no uh, good sy systematic and institutionalized way um, for, uh, uh, for both signaling, uh, pricing in uh, climate risk throughout China's economy, uh, but also determining how these burdens and costs are going to be uh, apportioned uh, and allocated. A final point on this, um, this is not for lack of trying. Uh, so for uh, uh, at least 20 years now, um, it's been a significant uh, policy objective to increase particularly flood insurance uh, coverage. When I was at the World Bank, we had a specific uh, project that uh, just looked at uh, lessons from the U.S. Uh, flood insurance, uh, federal flood insurance program. Uh, so it's not really for lack of uh, policy uh, prioritization um, that uh, this kind of gap uh, in terms of insurance coverage uh, persists. There are lots of kind of systemic uh, issues, which I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about if, if folks are interested. But this really, I think, is the crux of, uh, uh, of China's vulnerability going forward. Uh, I want to just sort of by way of, of concluding talk about a couple of uh, potential political and policy implications of all this. Um, first of all, and this is kind of on the more well, uh, I think, documented side of things, um, as you've seen an increase in extreme weather uh, uh, frequency and intensity in China, you have seen uh, an increase in uh, uh, public attention, uh, at least measured by things like mentions of climate change, climate warming uh, in Chinese media. That is, is pretty well uh, established. Um, what's not as established but is more important is what impact this might have uh, for example, on uh, uh, policy. Uh, so to what extent increasing attention being paid to or increasing awareness uh, of extreme weather climate impacts might translate into some degree of opinion formation or pressure. Uh, and here we get into the purely anecdotal uh, uh, kind of realm here. Uh, but I wanted to put up this uh, quote from, you know, it's just a sort of a random article I came across um, written uh, this past uh, summer. But I found this, uh, this paragraph sort of noteworthy. Uh, as the world's largest carbon emitter, China needs to exert its own power and influence, actively participate in international cooperation, and contribute to global climate governance. So there is a translation from this concern with extreme weather uh, frequency and its impact on China to talking about uh, some degree of sort of policy uh, action. It is also uh, clear uh, that the, no the perception of climate risk uh, and vulnerability to climate impacts does play a role in shaping China's uh, international climate policy. Uh, and this, I think, uh, is almost never recognized. Um, but if you uh, take a look, for example, at China's 2022 uh, climate adaptation strategy, um, you see language like this. And I'll, uh, I mean, all of this is sort of you know, arguably relevant, um, but I'll, uh, I'll draw your attention in, uh, uh, in particular to this last sentence here. As an important non-traditional security factor, Climate change brings with it long-term adverse effects, sudden extreme events that have become important risks faced by China in the process of basically realizing socialist modernization, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is a pretty clear statement of uh, the uh, direct explicit link uh, that uh, uh, China's leaders draw between climate risk, climate impacts, uh, and core uh, state priorities uh, and objectives. Uh, and I think there are some interesting implications that flow from this in terms of thinking about how to engage uh, China in international climate policy. Um, I'm happy to come back to that if folks are interested, but I've suggested, for example, that while uh, U.S.-China climate dialogue has to date almost exclusively been focused on mitigation, uh, maybe uh, there's some trust to be gained, some goodwill to be gained by uh, broadening the discussion to talk about bilateral adaptation cooperation, for example. Um, the real uh, question, though, is does any of this have any implication for China's own domestic climate and energy policy? And here it's worth just sort of briefly uh, mentioning that and probably as many of you know, uh, China has uh, two kind of headline uh, climate policy goals, one of which is to uh, reach net zero uh, 
uh, carbon dioxide emissions by 2060. Um, the second is to peak uh, its emissions by 2030 uh, at the latest. Um, the key thing both for China and the world uh, is what happens between uh, those two dates. And the graph you can see here basically shows different trajectories um, between essentially now and uh, 2050, but uh, most particularly uh, after 2030. And basically, uh, the slope of these curves uh, determines whether the world has any chance uh, of roughly meeting that two degree uh, uh, Celsius warming target uh, set in, uh, uh, in the Paris Agreement. So the crux of the matter really is, does any of this, does any potential uh, public uh, opinion or public pressure have any bearing uh, on which of these trajectories uh, are eventually chosen? Um, uh, I would hazard to say probably not, um, but I think it's a, uh, an interesting and important uh, question to investigate in some detail because, again, uh, the slope of these curves uh, makes absolutely all the difference, both for China and the world. Last thing I, I want to just sort of end on, admittedly this is a little bit provocative, um, but if, if, as I've suggested, uh, climate risk and climate vulnerability is both uh, kind of a, an underappreciated uh, uh, risk and vulnerability for China, but, but also that it plays uh, a distinctive role in uh, China's climate uh, and energy policy, and yet uh, we are uh, facing uh, a lot of uncertainty as to whether the world can prevent uh, a dangerous climate change. Does that mean uh, that China may eventually come to support uh, uh, something like climate intervention, otherwise known as geoengineering? Um, these are various muted, mooted solutions uh, to uh, essentially using artificial means to try to counteract uh, some of the uh, forcings that, that are the root cause uh, of climate change. Um, this is a, a, just shows a, a graphic from a piece uh, that uh, I co-wrote with uh, Ike Freeman, uh, who's probably known to some of you, he was a postdoc here until uh, just this past year. Uh, and this is what we think uh, is the first attempt to kind of uh, try to assess this question of what would China's position uh, on uh, geoengineering or climate intervention potentially be. Um, as far as we can tell, there are no official Chinese uh, government statements uh, on the issue, but um, uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, quotes and pronouncements uh, attributed, uh, attributable to uh, well-known Chinese climate scientists. And basically, uh, in our uh, uh, analysis or, or our estimation, um, we actually think that uh, China would be quite receptive to efforts to uh, construct a, uh, a responsible multilateral framework uh, for uh, potentially pursuing uh, geoengineering interventions. Um, I hope it doesn't come to this, uh, and I don't, uh, certainly am not a, uh, you know, a, a, a direct uh, advocate of geoengineering or climate intervention, uh, but I do worry that this is where, where we're headed. Uh, and I think this may be uh, an implication uh, of thinking about uh, China's vulnerability to extreme weather and climate risk uh, that we're increasingly going to have to think about. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you all so much. to frame your thoughts, your questions, and I also want to encourage our audience online, if you have any questions, any thoughts that you can share with us by typing them out in the chat box, I assume, on the Zoom. Uh, while you all are thinking, I'm going to take my privilege <laughs> as the organizer of the event to just to, to throw out some of uh, my um, gut feelings or and plus one questions. Sure. This is such a wonderful talk. It's so rich. It just it's uh, it just reminds me of so much thing so many different things I've been thinking and reading recently to respond to this last slide for instance in terms of geoengineering. I'm really intrigued by these climate scientists in different parts of China, the small scale projects that they're doing. For instance, uh, a group of climato uh, climatologists that are trying very much to build up this gigantic equipment, right, to cover up the glacial, <laughs> yeah. glacial mountains in the Venice Plateau. Every year, try to build up as big as a possible quilt to cover the ice, hopefully to prevent ice from melting, right? So this sort of kind of experiments going on. It's really interesting. I just want to put this out. And then in response to um, this idea, the state level, the state flood control headquarters. Mm. So I really appreciate you mentioning of how much 
uh, effort actually made it into it, into the state intervention, right, to take the leading role. And I think as a environmental historian, a fellow environmental historian sitting in this room, right, we often use China <coughs> as a, the uh, exemplary figure, an example to talk about uh, flood control and its intricate relationship with the state governance mm -hmm. and the formation of state power. So this reminded me uh, lately something really hot on Chinese media to talk about Xi Jinping's Shui Sixian, mm -hmm. the Xi Jinping thought on water management, mm -hmm. especially this summer after this horrific storm and uh, a, a flood in Beijing area, and all of a sudden there's a, such a push to formulate a systematic interpretation of Xi Jinping Zhi Shui Sixian. This is so interesting. And then um, you uh, brought up this slide showing 2020 flood, and this just really kind of like so close to my heart because I'm right now writing this book about East China, my hometown region of um, a, a long-term ecological <coughs> history all the way to 2020. 2020 is my stop, the end point for my book. And the end moment, it is really the summer flooding. Mm. And uh, um, I, my work focused on this the border region between Zhejiang and Anhui during <coughs> summer 2020, mm. it was horrifically flooded. So when I went back to my hometown to visit 2020, I saw the, this building, this, the kind of monument to commemorate the flood. And then the monument mm. is built in such a specific way. This is the uh, Western Zhejiang monument is built in such a way to show the vertical rise mm. of the flood all the way to 40 meters. Interesting. So that really introduced this kind of a monumental so kind of a symbolism to show people a new era is here, hmm. right? We used to live ground zero, now here everything's a 40 meter above, right? This is so interesting. This leads to my, I, my um, what I, uh, when I heard from you about the reservoirs road and the dam, and we have a dam scholar, um, yeah. Gosh here, and I, two of us are writing about dams right now. And so in China, even among historians, there's a group of people start to move into the field, uh, no, move into the direction to talk about this studies of dams. Shui Ku Xue, reservoir <laughs> studies. Yeah. People try to make Shui Ku a <laughs> subject of a study. It's really interesting. But when we talk about dams, uh, the reason I'm writing about the damming and water issue in my hometown region is it's always associated with the geological disasters, mm -hmm. right? The accumulation of uh, so much water, as we know, always associated with the disaster, the geological issues, such as a leaking and such as uh, uh, earthquake, all these issues. So I'm just very, very curious about all this. And here is the other thing related to Dan, the massive construction of Dan ever since the 1950s, right? I don't know if it's working on these issues more than I do. Um, also so coupled with <coughs> the rapid emergence of uh, new urban centers in mm -hmm. China. So the building dam facilitated building many towns, cities, new human settlements. And so this directly brings to your opening point about urbanization, which is a, such an overlooked issue, right? So I do have a question about this urbanization, but I wanted to call out uh, the uh, one name, one of our uh, environmental in Asia friend, whose name is uh, e. Jesse Roden, well, Rodenbiker, who is a ge geographer hmm. at uh, University Rutgers. And uh, he recently published a book entitled Ecological States in mm. Urbanizing China, specifically to mm. address the environmental issue, ecological issue in urban China. So I just wanted to, to bring, this, bring up this information. Jesse is coming to talk to us about his new book mm. in February next year. So those of you sitting online and here, please join us to, uh, to hear something from, uh, from this geographer. So I have this uh, silly question. Since you brought up urbanization, I wonder in the past 10, 15 years, China has been pushing this new policy of uh, new, uh, the develop, uh, new rural development, right? Encouraging people to leave gigantic mega city to move back to uh, townships, to mm -hmm. move, move back to reinvest the in, at the village level. And uh, during COVID and post-COVID, this policy is being pushed at its unprecedented speed. So we start to see the demographic shift now a little bit from Shanghai, Beijing to rural area. Um, of course, this policy, my understanding, is mainly for, is it for redistribution uh, of mm -hmm. labor yeah. and is it to deal with the uh, income gap. Right. Issue, right? 
But listening to, to my talk, I wonder, is there anything underneath this policy has something to do with the concern of the environmental, you know, ecological, this building ecological civilization, dealing with the climate change, dealing with the environmental issue, because urbanization contributed so much tremendously to the worsening of the situation, right? So I wonder this policy, whether or not try to address environmental issues in some weird way. Mm. So I'm just going to leave it here. Um, yeah, no, uh, and Ling, let me just say, first of all, I thought that when you, the slide that you presented first, where you kind of made the observation that there's sort of a similar ecological fate, I guess it's a social, you know, sort of human ecological fate, a thousand years apart in the same region. It's so fascinating. Um, and, and I both, you know, want to, want to come back to that, but also sort of use that to frame. I mean, um, I think there, there are so many kind of layers, uh, here. I think when it, when it comes to um, the kind of rural development strategy, um, I don't get the sense, to my knowledge, there's no explicit kind of climate, um, you know, kind of risk or vulnerability uh, angle to that. Um, and in fact, um, that for the most part, it's been more about kind of retrofitting China's uh, built environment uh, to the maximum extent. So I actually, in thinking, as you asked your question, I thought I should have had a slide on sponge cities. Um, uh, which is this kind of nationwide effort, you know, to increase the permeability of, of urban areas. Um, this, I, I hasten to say, is not a, like, new concept. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of well, uh, well known uh, among urban planners. Um, but it, like many other policy agendas in China, has, has kind of been promulgated at a very ambitious scale. Um, albeit, I would say, with, you know, uh, uh, sort of middling results so far. But basically that means... Uh, uh, trying to, to increase uh, 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 water, the storage capacity of natural water bodies in and around cities, for example, building uh, new like eco parks. Um, and I think you actually maybe alluded to that, um, Ling. So uh, as my kind of understanding would be that to, for the most part, it's not that there's been any kind of deprioritization of urbanization. Um, the, the response has been mostly to try to retrofit. Um, I would also just say that, you know, maybe just underscore that my kind of, you know, list of responses there, not all of them, in fact, very few of them, I would say, were like explicit responses to climate risk or vulnerability per se. I would say more they're like ingredients of adaptive capacity that were developed principally in kind of an era where climate risk wasn't, you know, really the driving kind of force uh, or consideration, but they have great utility in the era where it very much is. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's open the floor, and you can uh, pick your Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Peter? Yes, Peter Perdue. I guess along the lines, maybe a link question, <clears throat> I wonder if there isn't a sort of inherent bias in uh, state policy uh, in the social and uh, class direction, certainly a heavy bias toward urban focused solutions now, but that, that has always been the case really even before yeah. China's urbanization reached the stage was at all the way back to the 1950s, it was uh, urban biased in many, many ways. And then even within urban centers, bias toward very large urban centers, and within very large urban centers, bias toward Beijing, as we can see the, the reaction to the uh, air pollution problem uh, really only took off after the air apocalypse in Beijing and perhaps the major rainstorm in Beijing this year is what uh, jolts uh, more awareness of water uh, crisis. So how do you, uh, your, your general talk was, I, I thought, uh, nationwide, but how do you adjust this for really uh, environmental equity as uh, yeah. the state treats its different regions? And, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I mean, as, as a general matter, uh, poorly um, uh, to expand on that a little bit. So, um, you know, and I, I sort of said that I thought flood control was, um, you know, one of the bigger successes, uh, apart from macroeconomic performance, maybe of the kind of post reform uh, uh, state, not saying anything about the distributional uh, impact, but but simply kind of macroeconomic performance. Um, having said that, um, a really interesting and revealing thing, I think, about studying flood control 
um, is that it's very revealing uh, on those kind of distributional choices uh, and equity considerations. Um, protecting people from flooding, whether coastal or inland, um, is an extremely expensive task. Uh, and it can almost uh, always only be done through extensive central subsidy. Um, uh, and what I'm kind of saying now, by the way, channels uh, uh, a very interesting kind of political economy literature that in large part came out of the Harvard Water Project um, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so, you know, a lot of it, you know, kind of was, was uh, uh, arose from, from uh, very close to where we are now. Um, but one of the things that that literature highlights is that because of that expense and because of the typical need for central government subsidy for the infrastructure um, to, uh, uh, to control and, and manage flood risk, um, you always have questions about who gets protected and to what degree and who doesn't. Um, and you can imagine that uh, typically, and this is, uh, you know, was uh, the case in the United States, uh, in most other uh, countries where, you know, the literature exists, and is certainly the case in China, uh, it is the wealthier, the kind of more elite uh, uh, communities that get better and more extensive flood protection. Uh, it's also the case, I mean, this isn't so uh, uh, kind of salient now, but in earlier phases of China's urbanization, um, you know, to the extent that there was very kind of, um, uh, you would typically have uh, uh, the, the poorest residents settle on the most marginal land, floodplains, things like that. Um, and that's a global, you know, phenomenon as well. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, the result of policy decisions, but also just the, the risk profile um, of those populations uh, uh, was, was very high uh, to begin with. Um, so I think, you know, the, the basic answer to your question is that the equity dimension uh, uh, of this is really pronounced. Um, and China, like most countries, uh, uh, tends to uh, uh, preferentially protect um, the wealthier and more uh, uh, elite segments of the population. Chris. Yeah, I have a question that's kind of the flip side. Uh, of these questions on urbanization and also maybe gets to the, the uh, inequities. Question about inequities. Um, I'm wondering to what extent your review of the um, flooding risk or the changes in the, um, in the hydrological cycle is actually influencing the agriculture sector, influencing food production as a, you know, a natural priority of the Chinese state, but also potentially impacting or communities in China economically, if not, you know, if not their physical health, and I would think that would be a very um, significant um, sort of factor in thinking about you know, where things go. Yeah, and it's it's a great point. That is another set of slides I should uh, I should add. I mean, I I could say that. All of China's kind of adaptation uh, communications, so including that adaptation report that I mentioned, uh, and even going back to 2007 was kind of the, the first really kind of like um, signature high profile uh, 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 climate change policy statement intended for international audiences. That talked extensively about food security vulnerabilities, and all of those reports do. Um, so it's certainly the case that that's a, uh, that's a major concern. Um, and you're right that there is uh, uh, that in those documents they talk specifically about you know the implication for agricultural uh, livelihoods uh, and things like that. So you're absolutely right. Food security is a really important kind of um, uh, vector for caring uh, and being concerned about climate risk, extreme weather vulnerabilities. Um, yeah. Uh, my question is very much as an outsider or coming from the 11th century. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, most of my information about contemporary China comes from reading the Washington Post or the New York Times or BBC, uh, where one gets an impression of a state that is so much, so hyper-focused on issues of security and military expansion that uh, and keeping a lid on its population that uh, very important matters of policy are not getting attended to. And yet, the impression I get from your talk is that if you look at it from the perspective of environmental policy, whether or not the policies are biased in one direction or another, or the right policies at any given time, that there is a lot of ferment and intellectual, uh, that it's not being 
held down, that there's a lot going on in the environmental side. Are those two parts of the same picture, or are those of us who are only getting our information about the Xi Jinping state from the New York Times and the Washington Post being led astray? Well, I think, uh, first of all, just sort of broad strokes, I think, you know, as is so often the case, you know, many things can be true <laughs> uh, at, at, at once. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, it's certainly the case that there's a, a massive prioritization uh, of security. Um, it's also true that there is a lot of, a lot going on across, you know, social, economic, uh, other policy domains, m many of which are, are broadly positive. But with respect specifically to you know, this sort of uh, policy arena, climate, the interesting thing, I think, is that there's kind of been a securitization So if you, uh, of the, the discourse. So, oh, sorry, getting my uh, things confused here. Um, but if you kind of go back to this statement, I mean, notice that the characterization is climate change is an important non-traditional security factor. Um, now, I don't want to like totally overstate you know, that I don't think climate discourse has been as securitized as uh, it has, you know, in the Chinese context as it ha uh, has been elsewhere. Um, but there is that linkage. And I might just add that that change, uh, you know, to those of us who spend, uh, you know, an inordinate amount of time, uh, you know, parsing language like that, uh, this is a big change from a decade or so ago when uh, the Chinese government actively uh, dismissed, you know, attempts to kind of characterize China as a, I'm sorry, characterize climate change as a non-traditional uh, security issue. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. So this actually just builds up the conversation we just had with, with Paul. Uh, I'm thinking of the recent book uh, by Judith Shapiro and Li Yifei, yeah. which sort of makes the connection to, to precisely the two things that Paul pointed out to, right? To say in some ways that what is still, according to them, what is still driving a lot of the environmental policies is in effect the need to stay in power and to make sure that whatever you need to stay in power is, is in place. So I wonder what your reaction to that is, because that would seem to sort of connect this beyond just thinking of it in, in sort of traditional security terms, but more in terms of the survival of the, the party state itself. Yeah. So do you, do you think that's, that's a fair sort of characterization, or is something else going on? I do. Uh, first of all, it's a great, it's a great book. Uh, and second of all, yes. I mean, and, and I actually should, thank you for the prompt, because in my head, I was sort of, you know, I think the, the securitization kind of uh, discourse is one thing, but the, the, but the genuine kind of... Um, I think uh, 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 sense that climate does impact uh, key kind of core uh, uh, state priorities is is very real, um, and so I think you know when you and here there's sort of like I think a little bit of a differentiation of climate risk, extreme weather vulnerability, and sort of more general environmental policy, um, but nonetheless I think there is uh, you're right to say that there is uh, 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 that there is a sense of that uh, uh, policy in these areas does affect core state interests. So to that extent, they're perhaps uh, you know, elevated uh, uh, beyond other policy areas. To say one more kind of point about that, um, it's always been uh, my uh, uh, kind of um, uh, argument that uh, China has been really effective at uh, uh, essentially co-opting uh, environmentalism uh, and employing a lot of kind of really successful strategies uh, things like uh, being able to kind of divert uh, uh, blame for obvious environmental policy failures to local levels of government, uh, things like that. Um, and my interpretation of why uh, that strategy has been employed and why it's been so effective is that, um, uh, that there uh, really is a, a, a sense of concern that, that uh, environmental damage and degradation uh, is a, you know, a, a potential real threat uh, to uh, core uh, state and party objectives. Uh, great. We'll go to this side of the table. Uh, we'll go to the gentleman in the back, and then we'll go to Henry. Just to add on to this question, that since this uh, climate change is posing a real security problem to the state, then uh, are there specific reasons why as to why the state would suppress environmental activism or other forms of disclosure? I think it's more about shaping it. Um, than you know, suppressing it kind of whole, wholesale. Um, and I would say I think this has changed. You know, I, I regrettably haven't been uh, haven't been to uh, uh, to China since uh, since uh, the pandemic. Um, so uh, you know, uh, my you know, I have a lot to kind of learn about the uh, the on the ground uh, reality. But 
Um, it was the case um, uh, when I, when I uh, did do more kind of in-depth research in, uh, on environmental activism in China that, um, uh, that the, the state actually saw uh, kind of environmental activism as useful um, for two reasons. One was a little bit more self-interested. It was sort of an effective pressure release uh, valve um, for environmental policy failures, but it also, uh, in many cases, was helpful for environmental policy performance, uh, particularly uh, um, uh, uh, enforcement of environmental regulations. Uh, NGOs and activists often were uh, really good sources of information on uh, corrupt uh, uh, officials, for example, who were tolerating high levels of pollution. So they, in a sense, were uh, effective adjuncts to the kind of formal state environmental protection uh, bureaucracy. As that bureaucracy has gotten more capable, I think the importance of that, you know, function has decreased a little bit. Um, and it, it is my sense that uh, during the pandemic period, the space for environmental activism uh, did continue to shrink. It had already been shrinking for several years uh, prior to that, but my sense is that it had continued to shrink. That being said, you know, creative, and in my kind of experience or, or uh, impression, this is still true, uh, that, you know, creative sort of savvy activists, whether in the environmental field or elsewhere, um, are still, you know, able to, uh, uh, to operate. Henry. Yeah. yeah, this is totally based on anecdotal discussions I've had with Chinese officials, which have not been that many in the last three years. But some of them. And what I get is a tremendous focus on energy security, but also a desire to retain a lot of flexibility yeah. on how much they're going to have to do on the climate area. And that flexibility, uh, for example, Let's build um, a, a lot of coal plants in the next four years so we can get the peak way up so we have flexibility on the downside yeah. on how and when we come down yeah. uh, from that. Uh, the second is we don't want to pass a climate law, and they've been debating this for about 15 years, uh, because then we'll have to actually enforce it. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and if we don't have one, we have flexibility of sort of when to push and when to pull back. Yeah. Um, and so that's um, another characterization. And when I sort of be, I'm somewhat critical, uh, they push back on me and they say, well, we are going to be the world leader on uh, green industries. We're going to dominate green technologies like batteries. And that's going to be our contribution to the world on climate. We don't want other countries hmm. telling us how fast we need to move, and we want to retain the flexibility to move whatever, whatever the present situation requires us. So we want that flexibility going forward. Tell me why that's wrong. The, the, the green technology no, no, argument. All, all of the, oh, all of, all of that. All of that. Um, uh, Yet, no, I, I don't, I mean, I, somewhat unfortunately, I don't think it is, I don't think it is wrong. So, you know, I, I mentioned that I think the, in many ways, maybe the crux of this whole, you know, talk is, uh, is kind of more this slide. Does any of this matter um, with respect to these different trajectories? Which of these, you know, which of these lines China ends up following and how, uh, uh, how steep, you know, the, the, what the slope of those curves uh, look like? My, my guess is probably not um, for the reasons that, uh, that you mentioned. Uh, and incidentally, I, mean, I think, uh, you, know, the, you know, like most every other country, uh, you know, climate and energy policy is so uh, uh, vast in its kind of reach that there's a lot of debate um, over uh, prioritization, over speed uh, in the Chinese system, and in particular between a constituency that is, you know, more committed to aggressive climate uh, uh, action, so a steeper, you know, curve, um, versus those who would like to sort of slow roll uh, things at least a little bit, um, uh, in part because of economic, uh, you know, just sort of the, uh, the direct economic cost of decarbonization, uh, uh, as well as uh, energy security uh, considerations. There's a, a kind of a subgroup that I think is um, uh, especially important in that, um, that thinks about uh, the issue that you raised around uh, flexibility, I think through a slightly different way, which is that uh, we still don't have a great alternative to fossil fuels to provide flexibility in the grid, um, at least for most countries. Um, countries with really large nuclear fleets, for example, you know, might be able to do it. Um, but by and large, uh, there's not a great replacement. 
Um, and so, as, as you know, but just for the benefit of everybody else, the argument for why China continues to build coal capacity is, the, is that flexibility. They say, we're probably not even going to turn most of them on. But we need it because if we hit peak demand, we don't have enough renewables capacity um, uh, you know, in the grid and with enough storage to kind of necessarily meet that, meet that peak demand. Um, so that, um, you know, I don't think that's going to change um, because of public perception of uh, extreme weather events. But it, you know, but it might. Um, I mean, there's, I think, some tail, <laughs> you know, probability that it might. And so I do think that's why I say I think kind of more research on this kind of potential relationship. Um, incidents of extreme weather, public perceptions of extreme weather, climate risk to, you know, potential sort of uh, uh, opinion formation to potential policy action is, you know, definitely it warrants some further uh, uh, some further discussion, but I, I you know, uh, in, a, in a, a kind of objective uh, analysis, I, I don't think you would you would uh, do very well by betting a lot on uh, on that being true. So I do think, uh, you know, what you described, uh, you know, sounds right. And I, I guess my only the, only the last thing I would add is that that's not um, really a China specific um, sort of stance. Uh, I think that kind of represents essentially the global. Um, uh, stance where we have uh, uh, inescapable momentum toward uh, decarbonization, but it's it's going to be a drawn out transition, um, and it almost certainly is not going to, you know, be one of the more aggressive uh, uh, curves that you know that we see uh, that we see here. Which again kind of brings me back to, is this where we're headed? Optimistic. I wonder if you go back a few slides where there's that statement that said, as the world's largest carbon emitter. Yeah. Oh, the, whoops, there we go. As the world's largest carbon emitter. Well, I recall when China became the world's largest carbon emitter uh, in uh, public discourse, the Chinese vociferously rejected that characterization by saying, but if you look at the longer historical trajectory since the Industrial Revolution, it's clearly the Western countries that put the mass of uh, carbon into the air. And China should not bear this particular responsibility since those imperial powers in the past are really responsible. Is this a shift in uh, discourse? Well, that's, I, I mean, I think yes. Um, I mean, I think in sort of like, you know, multi-decadal <laughs> historical perspective, this is a massive shift. Now, I mean, it, as I said, this is essentially a random article, so I wouldn't like, you know, I, I'm not trying to sort of portray this as representative uh, of, of discourse overall. But, but yes, I mean, that's why it was so, so striking to me is that kind of change uh, in, uh, in kind of tone and, and recognition. Now, I mean, I hasten to say that as a, as a diplomatic matter in terms of international climate policy, uh, China, you know, has not uh, abandoned the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, so it's the case that, you know, China's formal diplomatic position is very much that uh, developed countries should bear uh, uh, the brunt of the cost associated with, uh, uh, with mitigating climate change because they caused the bulk of the problem. Um, which incidentally gets back to, I mean, I didn't really address, Henry, the kind of last part of your uh, uh, your statement around, you know, well, China's contribution is going to be to, um, you know, kind of essentially develop all the world's uh, clean and green technology, um, which, you know, uh, I mean, that, I mean, there is a, you know, there is certainly a strong uh, uh, case there in the sense that in almost every key kind of technology currently, China's the lowest cost producer. So whether it's solar panels, electrolyzers for hydrogen, um, I went to the UAE uh, back in May, sort of an advanced trip for this year's climate conference. And one of the things that was striking to me is the UAE is making a huge kind of play uh, uh, for uh, uh, blue hydrogen, which is uh, essentially hydrogen you produce from natural gas, but then you capture the, uh, uh, the resulting uh, emissions stored underground. Um, and all of the economics are based on using Chinese electrolyzers. Like they don't even look at, you know, uh, uh, potential alternatives. And that's pretty much true across the, the clean tech, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem. Um, the problem is geopolitics. The problem is uh, pretty much every large economy in the world has decided that 
uh, it wants to be the uh, major producer of uh, all of those key you know, clean technologies, including us here in the US, where our principal climate uh, you know, policy, the Inflation Reduction Act, is all premised on having lots of domestic content uh, 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 incentives. And, and so that kind of argument, uh, you know, I think, would be stronger if we were living in like a pre-2017 geopolitical uh, environment. Um, but in the one we're in, um, we're definitely looking at a very fragmented market for uh, clean and green technology. So I think it's much less likely uh, than it was before that we can sort of depend on China's manufacturing economies of scale to propel decarbonization, unfortunately. I really need to come up with some better, uh, more optimistic. Uh, I want to add something to the green industry here. So, of course, I, I, I'm aware you are speaking at a kind of international global level, like a multi-state uh, level. But thinking um, domestically, you want to bring the question back to the issue that Pierre and Paul brought up about equity, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in my kind of work, because I'm working on specific small part of China, and uh, because I'm looking into contemporary uh, ecological changes, so so I started to touch upon issues such as uh, green and uh, green industries like green uh, ecotourism, right? Mm. Sustainable farming at a very very local level. The thing is, what we are looking at is in many parts of China things are happening, and yet uh, the cost of uh, those model ecological green industries at different parts of China actually always happen at a cost of uh, the um, external harms to other parts of China. The other parts of China become a more hinterland, ecological hinterlands. So this kind of a orig traditional like a Deng, Deng, Deng Xiaoping era, right? Economic regional diversity, regional differences are now being kind of replicated in the ecological green terms. That's what I'm seeing at some ground level. So I, I know this is a different story from the international, right, geopolitical mm -hmm. issue you're talking about, but domestically I feel like where exactly those harms being externalized in order to support a greenization of a certain privileged part of China. So how, what's the trade-off? Right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Um, well, absolutely. And I mean, just to sort of a closing reflection on that, I mean, this is all, I mean, this is all fundamentally about, um, you know, who, who bears the cost of climate change uh, and to what degree. Uh, and it's absolutely the case that both kind of across countries, but within them as well, you know, it, it, it tends to be the, the poorest, most marginalized um, populations. That's, that's absolutely the case. And I think that's why um, uh, it is so, uh, uh, you know, so important, but also so striking uh, uh, that, I, you know, and again, just my overall argument, I, I think there is, uh, there are some good reasons to think that China um, is uh, uh, more exposed to at least certain manifestations of climate risk than mm -hmm. other large economies. Um, and I think the, the socioeconomic implications of that are, uh, are tremendous. Right. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Um, yeah, sure. So you talk about uh, China's efforts on flood control, especially in maybe the Pipe Island Plateau, where it's trying to build dams to uh, preserve waters from, like, uh, from mountains. Uh, and I wonder what are the nearby countries' reaction to this dam building project? Negative. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I have sort of a whole, you know, like sort of a, a, a spiel on this. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, so the uh, uh, construction of, of high dams uh, is a, a, a major issue on the Mekong. Um, that's that's the um, really the focal point for a lot of this um, uh, a lot of the discussion. I my sort of high level tagline on this tends to be that um, I think um, that the kind of uh, ecological, social, economic impacts of those dams tend to be obscured by um, the kind of geopolitical relationship between down, uh, downstream countries in Southeast Asia and China, um, which is to say that a lot of the discussion doesn't focus so much on the direct uh, uh, impact of changes in river flow. It's more about, you know, well, if China builds a dam, it can control the water. Uh, and, and that's bad because China is the powerful upstream kind of regional superpower. Um, so it, water kind of becomes like a, you know, a lens for that broader like geopolitical tension. Um, uh, to say, you know, one or two more sentences about it, um, 
the um, uh, the major impact has to do with uh, with flow, um, particular particularly at times of year um, uh, in the upper Mekong. Um, in the lower uh, Mekong, the impact uh, is actually pretty minimal because the flow is affected mostly from tributaries uh, and uh, uh, in, inbound kind of water supply from lower in the basin. Um, so the direct impact is, is pretty much concentrated in the upstream. Are the precipitation points in the ecological change in the impact of that? Yes, um, and, and here, uh, some good news. Uh, the Mekong River Commission, which is the major kind of like multilateral body that um, uh, that uh, tries to sort of, uh, you know, get all riparian countries or all countries uh, uh, through which the river flows uh, together um, just, I think it was early, earlier this month, a few in the very recent uh, uh, past, uh, brokered uh, a deal between China uh, and uh, downstream countries to share real-time reservoir data, um, which is a first. Um, that, that hadn't happened uh, in the past. There had been some more limited... Uh, water data sharing, and that's really important for uh, flood control, drought uh, prediction, all those sorts of things, to have that real-time uh, data from uh, reservoirs, which are impounded by those large dams uh, along the Mekong, is really important. And that's a really good sign for cooperation over, over water in the Mekong. And uh, Pascal, we have two questions from coming from our audience. Okay. And um, here are, do you want me to read them out? or? can read them out. Sure. So this is one picture here. And okay. Picture. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like very meta, this. Uh, um, okay, yeah. Uh, so I'll just read out the, the first one here. Uh, failure with insurance coverage. Since the investments into irrigation projects and climate mitigation comes mainly from the government, why should it be necessary to rely on insurance markets and not on direct governmental financing and expenditures to address climate disasters? So you certainly can, and that's essentially what's happening now. The problem with that is that it's very inefficient. Um, and it doesn't send any kind of signal um, to uh, people or enterprises to uh, build in places or do things in ways that make it less risky um, and that would essentially uh, uh, enhance adaptive capacity. Um, so if you think about uh, you know, your, uh, uh, your home insurance uh, premium, if you live, uh, uh, well, I, you know, I live in Philadelphia, so think about you know, on the Jersey Shore, uh, uh, you know, that sends a pretty strong signal, uh, economically speaking, that uh, maybe, you know, you, you should uh, think twice about this investment um, versus uh, a vacation house in the Catskills, um, for example. So you certainly can, um, but uh, insurance markets provide a way to kind of send a market signal and from an economic perspective, uh, at least, you know, in principle, more efficiently. Um, distribute and allocate the, the costs and, and risks and burdens associated with uh, uh, climate impacts and extreme weather. Okay, second, um, if I heard correctly, East Asia will get warmer at a, fa as a faster rate than other regions of the globe. In your opinion, what are the expected trends in foreign policy making in that region as climate change, which seems unstoppable while speeding up, uh, make all the first national responses useless? Um, uh, infrastructure and other measures. So um, this is, so I do think what it means is that climate policy um, does become more important both for China and other, uh, you know, regional actors. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, oh, I keep using the wrong, sorry. Um, you know, I think this is, this is an example of that, China's 2022 national adaptation strategy. Um, I think, again, the question is what material impact does it have on emissions trajectories? Um, and I, I sort of fear that even though there is a lot of kind of, um, you know, concern among high-level policymakers in China and other ma major Asian emitters, there are just too many barriers to taking the really aggressive decarbonization trajectories that we would need to avert, um, you know, catastrophic climate change. Um, again, this brings me back to something like this. Let me just say another word, though, about you know, climate intervention as, I think, a potential ingredient in international climate policy. Not your first, second, or third best solution, um, but what it might do is sort of bias precious time uh, to decarbonize. And here's where I think there is some optimistic, you know, kind of, uh, uh, there is an optimistic sense uh, uh, in all this. 
Um, basically, uh, what's become clear, I would say in as little as the past five years, is that not only is it possible to decarbonize the world economy, I would say as recently as five years ago, it wasn't totally clear that that was realistically possible. So now I would say not only is it clear that it's possible, it's clear that it is going to happen. What's not entirely clear is how long that transition is going to take. Again, it's probably longer than we have from a climate perspective. But that means if we can do something to buy us enough time, perhaps a couple decades, of trying to avert or blunt the worst impacts of climate change, that may actually get us to where we ultimately need to go. Um, and I would say if there's anybody you know, kind of particularly interested in that proposition, um, there's a uh, semi, you know, kind of secretive uh, effort called the Overshoot Commission um, that's kind of vaguely sponsored by under UN auspices. And basically what they're trying to uh, consider is the possibility, okay, what if we sort of break the two degree, you know, kind of threshold, which unleashes a lot of really bad climate stuff, but we are still able to decarbonize uh, as we get toward the 2060s, 2070s. How could we potentially bridge those two kind of dates? How could we eventually ensure that emissions overshoot, but then eventually come down and sort of keep us within that two degree threshold? Right. Henry. I can't resist, but um, the problem with the geoengineering scenario is the moral hazard problem. Absolutely. If you yep. actually do it, you people say, well, all we have to do is put these particles up in the air, and we don't need to get any more progress. Yeah. How do you deal with that moral hazard problem? Okay, so I'm definitely not like a geoengineering, like, I, I don't love it, you know? I, I don't, I'm not like trying to, I, to me it seems like an unfortunate, obvious place we're headed, but I don't like that one bit. And one reason for that is, is moral hazard, um, which is essentially the idea that it gives everybody a license, you know, to continue burning fossil fuels when really the only responsible way to employ it is, as I said, as sort of a temporary expedient or bridge to kind of plug a, you know, an emissions hole. Um, there are lots of other, I mean, there are lots of direct uh, impacts on things like precipitation in the Sahel um, that are pretty bad, at least if you're in the, in the most commonly, you know, talked about form of geoengineering is you basically recreate a volcanic eruption to cool, uh, to cool the planet. Um, uh, and then you've got, um, uh, you know, lots of kind of questions around uh, uh, could it be done unilaterally, um, uh, perhaps even by a really wealthy private individual, probably. Um, so it gets really, um, you know, really difficult. There's also the matter that, um, you know, obviously as soon as you stop in the, the cloud seeding example or uh, the uh, stratospheric aerosol injection example, recreating a volcanic eruption, as soon as you stop doing it, all the warming comes back, right? So it's a continuous, you gotta you know, keep doing it. It doesn't fix anything. Um, so there are all those you know, uh, problems with it. I just, you know, if, if you just think about the summer we just had, um, and again, the 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023 timeline I took us through, I'm just not sure how much further we can get before you sort of like break glass in case of emergency. Chris? Yeah, for, for what it's worth, I've heard Xi Jinping say he thinks it's a terrible idea. Yeah. And um, he's he very, very negative on geoengineering. Now, he's not going to be there forever. I assume that picture in your article they're referencing also the, the weather modification. Yep. That's cloud seeding. In yep. China, which is massive. And it seems easy, you know, it's easy to see how climate modification follows from local weather modification, you'd think there would be a lot of advocates within China for that. I have another question. Are we running out of time? Or? No, we have a few minutes. Okay, ahead. so it's sort of a low bar question, but I, I, it, it relates a little bit to this question about the Mekong, or your answer to the question about the Mekong River Basin. Um, can you go back to your slide on um, your success? You had one yeah. success slide? <laughs> one. Well, I think maybe maybe there was more than one. But. No, I think no. There was there was just one. Okay, so I had a little trouble seeing the, <laughs> the axes here. Sure, sorry. The axes on the on the left ones are affected population in millions, and this is direct economic loss in billions of U.S. dollars. Okay, so the thing that I wanted to just raise, and I'm curious if you encountered this in your 
investigations on this is this is, is the phenomenon of sort of early, it's kind of a soft information strategy that governments put in to mitigate um, flood risk and the, and the impacts on people and it's it's early warning systems yeah. and I mean you were talking about I've heard this before about the Mekong River um, Commission or the Mekong River Basin management that one of the problems is that China didn't even tell what was going on tell the countries downstream what was happening. Right. It's, it, I just heard that like a month ago, so I'm really interested to hear that that's changed. But like in Bangladesh, you know, the um, cyclones, not that long ago, like 10, 20 years ago, would kill 100,000 people. Now they kill like 20 people. Mm -hmm. And one of the primary reasons why that's true is that Bangladesh has developed a, a really sophisticated early warning system, and they get the information to the people faster. Yeah. I've also heard that that happens in um, the upstream Mekong and Yunnan, that China is actually, even, even as the flood um, profile is changing, um, the, the trend is good, at least if, if that, that's measuring impacted people partly because of some of these measures like that. And I think it's a, I think it's a really, I don't know, it's an interesting policy response that I think ought to be recognized in your, uh, your research. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And yeah, you're right. I should, have, uh, I should have dwelled more on it. But this is part of um, this kind of uh, approach, the, the digital Yellow River, and there are other examples of this in other basins, but is the integration of early warning uh, systems, flood prediction uh, software. Um, and yeah, absolutely. That's that's been a big focus. I actually worked on um, uh, a project uh, when I was at the bank that was uh, improvement of, of uh, flood early warning uh, uh, systems across uh, across China. So yeah, absolutely. And that's probably the single, you know, like lowest hanging fruit right. you can um, you can get. That's that's absolutely true. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't really intend to belabor this so much, but um, uh, just first of all, um, Chris, I, I appreciate your your kind of recollection there of, of Sia's comment, because um, I, I, we didn't, couldn't find anything on the record, basically. Um, uh, that doesn't surprise me, though. And I mean, I think one of the reasons that I think, uh, you know, Chinese sort of policymakers would be vociferously against uh, geoengineering is it, it does kind of uh, really undermine the Paris Agreement, which is, you know, the foundation of China's international climate policy. Um, uh, and just as a quick point, I mean, yeah, you know, when we sort of talk about it in the article, you would, you would think that, yeah, sort of China being the world's uh, most enthusiastic, you know, kind of cloud seeder weather modifier, that would translate into, uh, you know, something like support for uh, stratospheric aerosol injection. But it actually seems to be the opposite from what we can tell. Um, that, uh, I mean, first of all, technically, it, it's, it's quite different uh, in terms of how you would deliver uh, aerosols, but uh, uh, that really there seems to be a lot of deep skepticism. Um, yeah, I've researched that a little bit, and I know that even within the, the you know, the Chinese scientists involved in informing the, the, the weather modification, there's a lot of them that think this just doesn't work. It's almost, it's almost, it's almost like a symbolic thing that the, you know, that the local government does to reassure the, the farmers that they're doing something about the drought, you know, yeah. even if it's not really working. Right. Yeah. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> And I realized I forgot another question from the audience. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, can you talk about... No, it's not. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Totally me. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, can you say something about uh, the um, um, Three Gorges Dam? How has that worked for flood control? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's principally... Uh, uh, well, you know, an interesting fact, feature of large dams is they're always justified as, like, multi-use uh, you know, use projects. Um, so Three Gorges, you know, uh, like most large dams, was kind of justified um, as having a flood control function as well as uh, hydropower generation. But that being said, I mean, its, it's purpose is hydropower generation um, as opposed to, uh, to flood control. Um, the size of the dam does mean that it, you know, uh, it can certainly, uh, I mean, it impounds obviously just a, such a huge volume of water that um, it does have really significant impacts for downstream flow. And in that 2020 um, uh, 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 kind of extreme precipitation event, um, one of the reasons people were so concerned about the structural integrity of the dam was that the authorities were holding back a higher volume of water than average 
because the uh, precipitation was so extreme in the lower reaches. So the thought was any volume you can essentially save or, or keep behind three gorges um, is going to be volume that you can kind of compensate for uh, the extreme precipitation in the lower reaches. Um, so that was kind of the logic and, and why that, that nexus that nexus occurred. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, Three Gorges has huge implications for flood control and flood management, um, but, it, you know, for the, its primary purpose is really hydropower generation. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Well, with that note, I think we had a very rich, we heard a rich, very mm. rich talk and a very rich and uh, um, 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 a, a meaningful conversation here. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank Thanks, Ling, and th thanks so much to everybody. Thank you. Yeah.